Boy, isn't it a beautiful morning this morning? Amen. Boy, God is good to us all the time. Uh, if you've got your Bible, the, the notes there are our scripture. Main scripture is going to come from John chapter 13 this morning, verses 34 and 35. Um, kind of a long story as how the good Lord laid this on my heart, but uh, we're not going to go there. So we're just going to kind of open up God's word and, and jump right in a little bit this morning, and then we'll back up. But John chapter 13, Jesus speaking, says, A new command I give you, love one another. He goes on to say, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. You know, if you look at the story, Jesus and, the, and all of his disciples are gathered up. Jesus is heading to the cross. And... Uh, He's trying to tell them everything that they need to know before he goes to give them all the assurance that they can have. And, and, and I love Jesus' uh, attention to, to, to his, his followers. And, you know, he, he starts off with a new command I give you, love one another. And, you know, if we look at the Bible, that love one another wasn't really a new command. You know, if he was asked earlier in his uh, ministry you know what the greatest commandment was and and he said you know love god with all your heart all your mind all your soul and the second is just as is the same you know love yourself or love your neighbors as you do yourself you know and he wasn't speaking on his own then he was quoting old testament scriptures all the way back to deuteronomy and leviticus so that love one another was not a new concept but what he goes on to say is his new command as I have loved you, so you must love one another. You see, Jesus came to earth with a love that you and I really can't fathom yet. He came with that sacrificial love that, that give everything for someone else. <coughs> you know, and, and as he was talking to his, his uh, disciples, he said, that's the kind of love I want you to have so that you will show others that you're my disciples. You know, and... And as I like I said, there's, there's kind of a long story that brought me to this passage today. But, but the thought is, what happens if we tell people that we are Jesus' disciples and we don't love as he does? You know, there's a, there's a story, Mahatma Gandhi. We were fortunate enough to, to sit and listen to his grandson here a few years back. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi was a practicing Hindu. A and the story is that Gandhi said, if it weren't for Christians, I would become a Christian. You know, and that's a pretty heavy statement. But uh, what happened to Mr. Gandhi was he had heard the gospel. He'd, he'd started researching Christianity, and he was so intrigued by a Savior that would come from heaven and, and come to earth as a man and would go through everything that Jesus did for us and to die for us and then to come back to life so that we could have eternal life, that he thought, I'm going to check this out. So he decided to go to church. And what happened was when he stepped on the front step of that church, there was a man met him. And the man says, wait a minute. You're not high cash Indian. Or you're not white. You're not welcome here. And the words that that man spoke turned Gandhi against Christianity for the rest of his life. A Christian stood away, stood in the way of Gandhi becoming a Christian. You know, and, and that's, that is, uh, that was something that, that weighs on my heart every day, that, that my testimony does not get in the way of other people coming to see Jesus. You know, and, and as I, I, I do a lot of pondering and driving, you know, the wife will look at me sometimes, she'll say, what are you thinking? And, and I'll think, well, you really don't want to know. I'm just, I'm just kind of off in my own world. But I was doing that here just a few days ago, and, and I listened to the radio, I listened to the message, listened to good gospel music, some good contemporary stuff, and all that's on there. But uh, a song from Casting Crowns came on, and the name of it was Jesus, Friend of Sinners. And this isn't a new song, it's been out since 2012. But um, if, if, if you see me and I'm talking to you and I'm looking like I don't understand what you're saying, it's because I'm about half deaf. And, uh, and I, I don't pay attention too much sometimes. So that, those two combined get in the way of me really hearing things. And, and I've heard this song hundreds of times. 
but this week I really heard it. God opened my ears to what this song actually says, and a part of it says, um, Jesus, friends of sinners, we have strayed so far away. We cut down people in your name, but the sword was never ours to swing. It says, Jesus, friend of sinners, the truth become so hard to see. The world is on their way to you, but they're tripping over me. You know, uh, you might say, I would never stand at, the, at a church door, you know, and, and tell somebody that they weren't welcome. You know, and I was kind of thinking that same thing until God reminded me of a story in my life. See, a long time ago, uh, we didn't live in this great state of Texas. We lived in Missouri and uh, had a grandfather that that is a Cardinals fan, loved the Cardinals. And every year he would take us to a baseball game whenever one of the good rival teams would be there. And we'd, we'd been to the Cardinals game and, and uh, we had... The game was over. Everybody had made their way to their cars. And you know what the mob's like at the end of those games. Everybody's wanting to get going. And Julie's sister is a little bit directionally challenged, and she always gets lost. So we made the plan that Julie's uncle would be in front, Julie's sister in the middle, and I would be right behind. And we would try to get her home without having to find where she went. <laughs> well, during all this chaos trying to get out of this park, there was a gentleman that wanted to be in line in front of me. And um, I wouldn't say that we argued, but we argued. A and, and, and please forgive me because it's been quite several years ago, but at the end of this conversation that we were having, conversation, because things were getting very heated and I wanted to, to kind of calm them down. So I thought, I said, you know what, sir, Jesus loves you too. <laughs> and we, I let him in front of me and, and we went on down the road and uh, I let the uncle and the, and the uh, sister-in-law get on ahead of us. Well, that was back whenever we just started getting cell phones and stuff. So yeah. uncle calls me. He says, hey, we're out here on the interstate. Things have kind of botched up. There's been an accident. You need to be in the right lane to get around everything. So I thought, yes, got that. Hit the right lane. And as I'm going past the crowd, I see this gentleman stuck in traffic that has just caused all this trouble in the parking lot and as I pass him I give him a big old wave and some of you might imagine it wasn't a nice wave but it sounds funny but it wasn't because what if that is the only connection that that gentleman ever had with the gospel I mentioned Jesus's name but then I stepped on Jesus's name Jesus says love like Jesus would love. Jesus wouldn't have done that. Maybe this man went to the same church that Gandhi went to and he saw nothing but hate and argumentativeness. Gets pretty heavy, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, but we go on down through and the good part is there is the truth. You know, there's a verse that we all know, John 3, 16. Amen. Thank you, Melissa. That's the one. That's the one that we all know so well. But I think we should memorize the next verse and have it on our tongues right after that. Because the Bible says in verse 17, For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You know, Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so many times, I started, I was going to say we as Christians, but I'm going to back up and I'm going to say I. I don't stand up to what Jesus asked me to do, to love people like he did, so that others can see him and know that we are his disciples. There's an old proverb that I found while I was studying and reading. It's actually a Buddhist uh, saying. It says, don't confuse the finger pointing at the moon for the moon itself. And you know, that saying can be good for each and every person here today. You know, because once in a while we get to pointing towards Jesus and uh, I'm going to back up and say once in a while I do. And, and I get to thinking that I'm better than other people. That I might be Jesus myself but I'm not. 
our Lord and Savior was the only one that was ever perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm just like everybody else. We're all in the same boat. We're all God's creation that's loved by God so much that he sent his son to die for us. And I am not Jesus. I'll stand up with John and say, I am not the Savior. But you know, there's, there's something else for, for even those that aren't Christian, if you're here today or if you're listening. I would ask you, don't confuse the finger that's pointing towards the moon for the moon. And what I mean is, so many times people that uh, see Christianity will say, I don't want to be a Christian. All there is a bunch of hypocrites as Christians. And yes, we are all hypocrites. You know, we all fail. We're all, none of us are perfect. But you know what? Jesus is. Jesus died on the cross for us. He's the one that loves each and every one of us more than anybody can ever imagine. And we are to be the finger pointing at Jesus and saying he's the one. Jesus is the one. And I hope that if I have ever been a stumbling block for anybody, that you look past the finger pointing at Jesus and look to the man, look to the Savior, look to God that can save you and that loves you more than you can ever imagine. For God so loved the world. And that means each and every person, not just me, not just worth, but everyone. He loves you enough to send his only son that we can have everlasting life and he didn't come to condemn us he came to save us that's the god that we love that we serve you know what each and every one of us are the church and people come to church every day when they meet us in the streets and we're to be the one that jesus called us to be the one that says i love god and i love you I would rewrite that, that uh, saying and say, don't let the finger pointing towards the sun, and I would spell that S-O-N. Don't confuse that finger with the sun itself. God loves you, and I love you. Bow with me for a minute. Father, we do thank you that you do love us, that you love us more than anybody can ever imagine. And Father, sometimes... As your servants, we mess up. And Lord, I just pray that when we do, that others look past the finger that's pointing towards you and see you instead of us. Because Lord, none of us are perfect. But you sent Jesus so that we could be righteous in his righteousness, not our own. Thank you so much, Father, for your grace and your mercy. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. New, 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 new. Thank you, Melissa. You know what? I am actually glad to be here. I am excited because God has shown up with us. And I want to I wanna give a little disclaimer. Most of the time, I really do think I have it figured out. And then God comes along and reminds me, no. He's got the big plan. He's got the, the master plan. And it's him that I need to be listening to. Um, this morning, we're not going to be in Haggai. I apologize, but we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Um, this morning, early, I got to preach at uh, Lone Star. And God, just between Lone Star Arena and Cowboy Church, God said, are you listening to me? This is what I want you to preach. Because there are so many misconceptions about the church, and unfortunately it's not just the outside world that has these misconceptions. So many times we look right behind you and we say, that is the church. Folks, that's not the church, that's a metal building. You look around and you will see the church. The church is God's people. The church is God's redeemed. The church is those who Jesus has ransomed and paid the price for your sins. That is the church. So many times we also think of the church as a place where people who gather who are perfect. I've not met 
any of those people yet. And believe me, I look at one in the mirror every morning. Not perfect. But we have a hard time sometimes dealing with this idea of not being perfect. We have a hard time dealing with things that we might call failures, things that we might call valleys, things that we might even call sin. Wednesday, I was talking about your identity and how important it is to understand what your true identity is. Because if you belong to Jesus, if you have received forgiveness for sin, if you are a member of the church, you have a new identity. And it's within that identity that you live life and follow God. Now, do we mess up? You better believe it. You're looking at the biggest messer-upper there ever was. Maybe that's one of the reasons that I, ident I identify with Peter. I love the Apostle Peter. Simon Peter, he's got a lot of enthusiasm. I like that. I appreciate that. I identify with that. I, like, I, I enjoy being around people who are passionate for Jesus Christ. If you, want to, if you want to snore about Jesus, i go somewhere else. I want to be around people who are passionate for the Savior who loved you, who died for you, who shed His blood for you, who redeemed you. Now, Peter is one of those guys that when he messes up, he messes up big. Okay? He's an all-in kind of guy. And his biggest mess up was denying Jesus. When Jesus went to the cross, you remember it was Peter who said, you know, Lord, these others may fall away, they may stumble, they may deny you, but I never will. What did Peter do? Three times before the rooster crowed, he denied Jesus, Melissa. That's exactly right. And you know what? He was having a hard time getting over that. He was allowing that failure to define his identity. But Jesus had something to say about that. I want you to look with me in John chapter 21. John chapter 21, Jesus is with his disciples before he ascends back up to heaven. He has gone fishing with them. He has eaten with them. All of these other things. And in John chapter 21, beginning in verse 30, uh, excuse me, uh, John 21, there we go, verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, remember, I, 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 before we go any further, part of, of coming to God's Word is, is spending enough time thinking about it to catch the tone, to catch what is fully going on. I'm, I'm a picture person. I am picturing this in my mind. And here is Peter. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Okay, does any of your Bibles have an exclamation point? No, there's not an exclamation point. Peter is hanging back. He is he's still wanting to love God. He is still wanting to serve Jesus. He is still desiring all of those things. Yet, because of what has happened in his life, he is stepping back, he's got his head down, and he is not the same old Peter. So when it, Jesus asks, do you love me? He's not exclaiming it. He's not shouting it. In fact, his, his voice level lowers just a little bit. Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I picture Jesus looking Peter square in the eye. 
And I don't know that he's saying it loud enough for the rest of the disciples to hear. This is his conversation with Peter. This was a private conversation. He's not holding Peter out. He is not trying to make a spectacle of him. He is dealing with him one on one. He answered, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? Now remember, here, uh, uh, John is helping us hear the words. Here is Peter who had already been crushed. He had denied Jesus three times. And now three times Jesus is asking him, do you love me? He's hurt. He's not up in Jesus' face. He's not shouting. He's not jumping up and down, waving his arms. His head is bowed. His eyes are looking at the ground. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I've preached this several times. This is one of my favorite verses because it has to do with our identity. It has to do with our identity. The, your subtitle may read, Jesus Reinstating Peter. But Jesus is coming to him, and, and he is dealing with him one-on-one. -on -one. Peter has blown it. He has blown it. I can identify there has been times in my life where I have blown it. You know this. The, the, the wording the, it, that's important is not in the sheep and the lambs. It's a generic word that's being used. It, it's not... Uh, the, the distinction there is not the important thing. The distinction is in the word words love. Because... Jesus, I mean, it sounds like it's just going in a circle, doesn't it? Do you love me? You know I love you. Do you love me? You know I love you. Do you love me? You know I love you. That's not what's going on. Jesus came to Peter and he said, Come here, Woody. He said, Peter. He, he, Jesus comes up alongside him. Jesus, I picture his arm around Peter. This man who is devastated. And he looks at him and he says, Peter, do you love me? Agape is the word that's used. Do you agape me? That God love, that love that is self-sacrificing, self-giving, the love that has to do with others before self. When God so loved the world, this is the word, agape. And what Peter says is not agape. He says, yes, Lord, I, I phileo, that brotherly love. In other words, I, I want to be up here. But Jesus, in reality, I'm down here. I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I am having a hard time. He says, feed my sheep. Look this way. Second time, Jesus asked him, Peter, do you agape me? And it, it's just Peter is feeling is, is, is down, torn down, hurt. No, I'm not up here. I'm down here. Lord, I'm trying, but all I can get is to, uh, to phileo. He says, feed my lambs. Look out there. And the third time, Jesus does not say, do you agape me? He uses the word phileo. He says, are you really trying? Is this your heart's desire? Is this where you're at? And Peter responds, yes, God, this is where I am at. I phileo you. Feed my sheep. What Jesus is doing in putting his arm around, 
He's not saying, Peter, look back here. Do you see that? You denied me three times. How could you do that? How could you be a disciple? How could you have walked with me two and a half years? How could you have denied me? I chose you. No, he never beats up on Peter. He never, never tells him to look back. He says, you look forward because you have a new identity. You are going to have struggles. You are going to have some hard times. But in me, you can do it. Your identity, you know, the, the word, the name David. Everybody familiar with the name David? I love that name. In the Hebrew, I'm going to give you a quick Hebrew lesson. lesson. Remember, the Hebrew is very easy. The emphasis is always on the second syllable. So the name is David. Okay? My first name is David. And it was quite a while before I began to understand what all that means. The name D David, or David, actually means beloved. It means beloved. Who are you beloved by? You are beloved by Jesus. He loves you. He was saying, Peter, you look in the mirror. You're not a failure. You do not allow one mistake to define your entire life. I died for you. I shed my blood for you. In me, you are a new creation. Your identity is not in past failures. Your identity is in me. And in a very real sense, every one of your first names, first name is David. You are the beloved of God. That's your identity. That's who you are. And in that, he said, you don't go backwards. I want to challenge you. Look in God's Word. How many times does Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit say retreat? Not one time. Not one time. You don't look back. You don't live in the past. You own your identity in Jesus. And when you do that, you keep moving forward in Jesus. Was his, because Peter messed up, did that mean that God couldn't use him anymore? No. He tells us he's going to be crucified. He's going to be crucified for Jesus. He is still going to be someone that is going to affect the world for Christ. His name is not, I deny Jesus. His name is not failure. His name is the rock, the beloved of God. Right now, where you are, I want you to stand. Every single person stand. And I want you to say, I am David. I am the beloved. My identity is not in a failure. My identity is in Jesus my God. Father, we thank you that we are who you say we are. We are who we are in you. God, our past is just that. It's the past. And the blood that you shed is enough for every single sin. Not just one, not just two. But it covers it. And when it's covered, you expiate it. You throw it away. It's as far as away as the east is from the west. And we are yours. Your church. Your people. And God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Beloved, I love you. May God bless you.